Genesis 1-1 describes God as the creator of all things in the universe, not just earth. If we make contact with intelligent aliens, how will religion respond? I performed about 124 quintillion, quintillion, floating point operations, analyzing signals from the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. Reverend John Fluth is a member of SETI at Home, a distributed computing network that processes transmissions from the world's largest radio telescopes. These signals are relayed to the group's 100,000 plus users and analyzed on their personal computers. For Fluth, SETI, or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is happening in the back of his church. Really the whole maintenance I have is just making sure it's online and uh -huh. using dust off. Okay. So I've got two here, I've got three at home. I really enjoy working on computers. How do they actually distribute the data? The information comes cut up into little sections. Each little section goes to three computers. If all three computers have the same results, it's accepted. SETI at Home is listening for the unique transmissions of life. So when data separately analyzed by four users confirms the location of a distinct signal, scientists can better pinpoint where there might be signs of intelligence. Why did SETI choose to go this route of crowdsourcing citizen scientists to analyze the data? Time on a supercomputer is very expensive. With distributed computing, it's free. What do you think the odds of us discovering extraterrestrial intelligence are? It seems very high. And as more and more we look, we're finding more and more planets that could support life. Given the vastness of the universe, it seems illogical to say that we're alone. In fact, mathematically, it's almost impossible. The Drake Equation, created in 1961 by astronomer Frank Drake, calculates the odds of contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. It uses factors like the rate of star formation, the number of planets, and the fraction of those in the habitable zone. We met the man widely considered to be the father of this scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence, Frank Drake. What was the motivation for sitting out to, to develop this equation? The equation was designed to give us an idea of how many detectable civilizations there are in the universe. And it's based on what we know, and we know a lot about the history of life on Earth. And so we simply quantify that history. How many civilizations are there? Well, how many stars are there? What would you say is the greatest uncertainty in that equation? And how has that certainty changed for the different variables over time? When we first started searching, we didn't really have an idea of how many planets there were in space, uh, how many Earth-like civilizations there might be. We were guessing in the dark. When the equation was first written, there was only one which we actually knew, which was the rate of proformation of stars in our galaxy. Since then, we have learned through observation the real values of most of the other factors. We've learned from recent studies this wonderful thing that almost every star has a planetary system, and a large fraction of those, probably more than a quarter, have a planet situated at a, such a distance from the star that the temperature in particular is suitable for life. And thus there may be many more inhabited planets than we ever imagined. And of course, that's very encouraging. So I guess kind of in a way, we're just getting started in this search. Yes, we're the beginners. We're the new kids on the block. We may have to search a million stars before we will hit on one that's transmitting a detectable signal. And that's hard but it's sure worth doing because the eventual discovery will be the biggest payoff of anything you've ever done in the history of the world. Although there's no definitive solution for the Drake equation, the more planets we discover, the better our odds of finding life. 
Just last year, astronomers found a system of seven Earth-sized planets, and NASA can now identify more than 3,500 exoplanets, many that could be habitable. In less than a decade, we've leapt exponentially closer to finding life beyond Earth, and we may find the first evidence of it within our own solar system. Ellen Stofan served as NASA's chief scientist and is one of the foremost experts on the alien worlds of our outer solar system. She says the more we know about how life began here, the greater our shot of finding it out there. There are theories that life actually originated in a hot spring, maybe not too different from this one right here on Earth. Now, to get life, you need organic molecules, which are actually pretty abundant throughout the solar system. But you also need, we think, water in our hot spring, and you also need a source of energy. So a spring really has all the critical ingredients that allow us to get to life. I mean, this is probably one of the more alien places on planet Earth. Elsewhere in our solar system, there are systems just like this, right? That's right. Lift off of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Saturn has this moon called Enceladus. It's got a thick icy crust. Underneath that icy crust is a subsurface water ocean. The amazing thing about Enceladus is it's got these giant cracks across the surface. And out of those cracks, that subsurface liquid water ocean is actually erupting into space, not that dissimilarly from Old Faithful. So we actually took the Cassini spacecraft and we flew it right through those eruption plumes. In fact, at the lowest, we were about 26 miles above the surface. And so we actually got to sample the material coming out of Enceladus. Incredibly exciting. We measured water and we measured silica. We also found organic molecules. So probably means there are hydrothermal volcanic vents oh, erupting at the yeah. bottom of that ocean. That makes me optimistic that this time of finding life beyond Earth is actually much closer than we think. For more than 50 years, one of NASA's prime directives has been exploring the possibility of life beyond Earth. From missions like the Voyager program, carrying the golden record, a disc bearing sounds and images of Earth, to tell humanity's story to anyone who might find it floating through the cosmos, to the last decade's series of surface rovers and planetary probes. And at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, astrobiologists like Mike Russell are honing in on precisely where we might find life. Oh, wow. So this over here is actual flight hardware. This is going to land on Mars? That's right. In a few years, this will be sitting on another planet. Yeah. That's incredible. It's robots like these that are the explorers that are trying to answer these questions about life. Yes. Uh, the robots are getting better and better. We've got underwater robots now being developed at JPL, which I, I can actually go underneath the ice. In fact, they use them in Ant Antarctica. It's very, very exciting. And to put all that flight hardware to work, NASA is stacking missions to the outer planets and moons, spending billions of dollars on planetary science related to the genesis of life. Most people would be surprised that NASA is devoting so many resources to the question of, you know, is there life outside of Earth? So what are some of those missions that are coming up on the slate? So Mars 2020 will be drilling into uh, part of the crust of Mars. The big thing is to get some rocks back that aren't just the rubbish from meteorites that have been smashed into Burned the, up, the yeah. Earth. Yes. The second one is ELF, and that's the Enceladus Life Finder. We know there's hydrogen there, we know there's carbon dioxide there. They're the two almost magic ingredients. And finally, Europa. And that's going to be doing some spectroscopic work to see how many oxidants there that life could use. Is it your opinion that if all the conditions for life are present, that life will arise? Or is there something missing in our understanding, something necessary for it to arise? No, it'll arise. Okay. It's inevitable. As soon as all the materials are available and the right amount of disequilibrium is available, it never doesn't happen. But uh, consciousness is it's hard to get, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, but there will be. Right, it's just a game of numbers. It's I mean, a game of numbers. There's so many yes. worlds out yes. there. And they're a long way away. To reach these far-off worlds, a radical new way of thinking about space travel 
is being boosted by private philanthropists. Russian billionaire Yuri Milner has pledged $100 million and enlisted the support of Mark Zuckerberg and the late Stephen Hawking on a quest to reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to our sun. The limit that confronts us now is the great void between us and the stars. But now we can transcend it. We can launch a mission to Alpha Centauri within a generation. This NASA-backed effort called Breakthrough Starshot is developing a propulsion system for spacecraft to travel at what essentially amounts to warp speed. If we ever want to explore interstellar distances, there's nothing that we're currently using that will do that. Philip Lubin, a professor of physics at UC Santa Barbara, who is part of the Breakthrough Starshot team, has invented a way for humanity to finally travel these vast distances of space and time. Everything goes into space today uses chemical propulsion. And chemical propulsion has literally not changed very much in terms of the energy extraction from the materials in more than a thousand years. So what we're looking at is sort of a radically different solution. It basically means that what, whatever propellant you're using has to come out of the spacecraft at pretty close to the speed of light. This system is a demonstration and a test system. Each lens uh, has its own laser and they're all synchronized. You can see the individual beams and then they converge on the target. If they're not synchronized, the light spreads out and it's not effective. When they are synchronized, the spot stays on target for much longer and we go much faster. So having that phased array basically allows you to hit the spacecraft longer, which allows you to accelerate to, to higher velocities. Yes, exactly. Like early sailing ships propelled by the force of the wind, Lubin's design propels spacecraft using light. Lasers fire as a coherent beam of light from the ground, propelling light cells on the vessels into deep space. Breakthrough's goal is to make these nanocraft 600 times faster than any other spacecraft in history. If we look at very simple spacecraft, something like that could achieve roughly 20 to 40% the speed of light. We're talking about a radical change in the way that you send any spacecraft out. But if human beings are going to travel at the speed of light, we also need to know if our bodies can survive the journey, which is pushing scientists to breed tiny cosmic explorers for a whole new kind of interstellar adventure. So within these liquid nitrogen freezers, we have stacks of worms, millions of worms basically in this whole freezer wow. that have been frozen away. These are in suspended animation. They will not develop. They'll just stay in that condition indefinitely. Wow. We can then take them out, thaw them out anytime we want, and within two days, they're adults and they're producing eggs and producing the next generation. These worms, known as C. elegans, have a simple anatomy, yet exhibit physiology common to much more sophisticated animals, making them ideal for biological research. C. elegans is one of the most intensively studied animals on the planet. But most importantly, it can be put in suspended animation. So we can freeze them away and then thaw them any way along the way as we take a trip across the cosmos. C. elegans aren't the only hardy little critters being recruited for extrasolar travel. Tardigrades can survive everything from freezing temperatures to intense radiation. And scientists consider them some of the most resilient creatures on the planet. They have very high radiation resistance, about a thousand times more than humans do, um, so they can handle a kind of a tough trip. Now, if we're going to ever leave the solar system as humans, uh, we have to know if life can even make it, any kind of life. Kind of like sending a canary into a coal That's mine. exactly right. These are our little canaries. So we can guarantee, if this project works, that there will be extraterrestrial life because we will create it. Many people want to know, are there other creatures in space? Are we the only ones? If we are not the only ones, what are those other creatures like? What do they know that we don't know? And we appreciate that many of them, if they exist, most of them will be older than we are. They can tell us things we don't know. And what will that moment mean when we make first contact with an intelligent species outside of Earth. And what will that moment mean for humanity, for our species? Twice I've actually thought I found it. And I'll tell you, when that happens, you feel a very special emotion that you never feel otherwise. This emotion is best described as everything is going to change.